From training to performing, join our Big League Conversation. Welcome to the CSP Elite Baseball Development Podcast with your host, Eric Cressy. Welcome back to the CSP Elite Baseball Development Podcast. I'm your host, Eric Cressy, and this is episode 88. We're continuing a little bit of a sports medicine theme of late as we bring on a physiotherapist from European football and rugby who I think has some great insights to bring to the show. One of the trends we've seen on this podcast is that I've tried to bring people from different walks of life to contribute to the world of baseball, which sometimes can be a little bit closed-minded to these things. So I think it'll provide a perfect complement to what we've seen from players, coaches, orthopedic surgeons, physical therapists here from the U.S., as he brings some unique insights um, in light of some of the research he's done with force plates and a collection of other different things um, in, in those populations. So I'm really excited for today's show. He's a great guy with a lot to share. If you're a baseball pitcher, you know that keeping your arm healthy is essential. But with high training volumes on top of participation in games, that's not always easy. Overuse is a significant problem for players at every level of competition right now. Certainly, we see elbow and shoulder injuries as some of the most common overuse injuries in baseball. At the professional level, an ulnar collateral ligament of the elbow injury can result in an average of 17.2 months out of competition. For youth players, overuse is also a predominant injury mechanism of injury. If you miss out on that much time, you're also missing out on a lot of development. So really, at the end of the day, there are three ways we can combat overuse. First, you can reduce workload. And certainly, there have been a lot of research studies out there on pitch counts. Second, and the theme of this podcast, is that you can build a significant level of fitness to prepare yourself. However, a third key approach that's often overlooked is that you can work to improve your recovery so that you can safely display the fitness that you've built day in and day out. And that's really where Mark Pro is an effective tool. Some athletes will even use it to warm up their arms before they throw. Mark Pro is a cutting edge EMS device that uses patented technology to create non-fatiguing muscle activation. And this is what sets it apart from other recovery tools. Muscle activation with Mark Pro facilitates each stage of the body's natural recovery process, similar to active recovery, but without the extra effort and muscular fatigue. Athletes can use it for as long as they need to ensure a more full and quick recovery between training or games. With its portability and ease of use, players can use Mark Pro while traveling between games or while relaxing at home. We even have players that use it all the time on team flights to help them bounce back. We have plenty of pro athletes that use this and players from every Major League Baseball team use it. Put Mark Pro to the test for yourself and take advantage of the great deal they have set up for our listeners through the end of May. Just head to markpro.com and use promo code CRESSY at checkout for 20% off your order. Again, that's markpro.com, M-A-R-C-P-R-O.com and use the promo code CRESSY, C-R-E-S-S-E-Y at checkout to get 20% off your order through the end of May. Today's guest has two decades of experience in high-performing teams and is supported by his dual master's qualification as both a physiotherapist and strength conditioning coach. After six seasons with Arsenal's first team, he became the director of performance at Sparta Prague in European football. The athletic shoulder testing and monitoring philosophy combines his shoulder expertise with over 10 years of monitoring athletes in performance environments. He currently consults in MLB, NFL, and is working with teams and organizations worldwide to help them optimize athletic shoulder performance. He's a clinical research consultant for the Shoulder Pathway at the Institute of Sport, Exercise, and Health in London, and a PhD candidate at Liverpool Hope University, where he hopes to build on existing shoulder research publications in the overhead athlete. Please welcome to the show, Ben Ashworth. Welcome to the show, Ben. Thanks very much for having me, mate. Thank you. I'm uh, I'm excited to do this from from all the way across the world. I know it was tough to get it scheduled all the different time zones we're in, but we made it work. Um, And we're we're doing a little bit of a home and home series and let you're going to release this on yours and I'm going to release it on mine. So we we both get some good content out of it while we're starting the craziness of the season here. Um, So I'm I'm curious. I, I, I know, obviously we've had a lot of great dialogues. We had an awesome visit when you came to the States a couple of years ago and, and you've collaborated with with a couple of different major league teams as well. Um, How does a European guy, get interested in baseball and where is it taking you? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, I think it starts a, a long time ago. It's all about sort of solving shoulder problems. And, um, you know, most of the research comes from baseball around shoulders. So I started out in rugby and you get a lot of shoulder injuries in rugby. And the main sport that 
linked shoulders to baseball for me was judo. So it was a throwing sport and there's not much research written in judo um, around shoulders, but there is a lot of research in baseball around shoulders and throwing. So yeah, that's when I started to get more interested um, prior to prior to the London Olympics back in 2012. And um, since then I developed some research and then that research has gone on to be used um, in lots of overhead athletes, sports, and people have reached out to me and I've had some great discussions, as you mentioned, with, with teams since, since I saw you um, a couple of years ago. Yeah. And I think it's, um, I mean, that's such an important lesson. It's, and, you know, it's the reason you're on this podcast also is, you know, I think it's so important that we look to, to other fields. You know, we've had, you know, Dr. Greg Rose on who, you know, had his beginnings in golf and, you know, you just have to look to other disciplines to try to try to benefit. I think baseball historically has been something that's been a little bit more close minded to those interactions. Um, you know, and it seems like over the last five to 10 years that's, that's dramatically changed. And, you know, the hope of this podcast is to kind of help lead that charge where you can get orthopedic surgeons and physical therapists and strength addition coaches and skill coaches and folks from all different walks of life contributing to kind of take this thing to higher ground. Um, so, you know, w- one area where I know you've really done that is, is, you know, in speaking broadly is this, this you know, concept of monitoring athletes, um, you know, what you can do to, to use it to add value over time to, to influence player programming, player management. Um, and it's interesting when I, ahead of time, I said, Hey, what do you think about talking about monitoring? You were all about it. And you actually replied, could I get a little philosophical here? And a, a thousand percent. Yes. So let, let's do it, man. The floor is yours. Wow. Yeah. That's a, that's a good start to a, any, any question. I think, I think uh, that the philosophical side of it is, you know, I've got about a decade now of experience in terms of monitoring shoulders and I have also got over a decade's worth of monitoring, you know, other parts of the body. And the, the understanding around what monitoring is about is it's essentially trying to replace this, you know, concept that you measure people at the beginning of a season. And then that gives you enough information to decide or predict how they're going to perform or whether they're going to get injured throughout the season. And for me, that's a, that's a flawed way of thinking. So monitoring, regular testing, whatever you want to call it, um, it's basically tracking some things throughout a season that are going to help you get, get a better picture of that athlete's state at any one time. Um, there's, of course, a lot of things around that. So it's not just what you choose to measure. It's what you know, is available to your team in terms of you know, technology, software, and hardware. It's about the culture that you're working in. You know, the ability to get buy-in from coaches and from players to go through that sort of monitoring process. So there's so much more about monitoring than just the the details of what you measure. It's about how you get the best data, how relevant it is to your context and your environment. And also how does it fit in with the culture and the coaches and the players that you're working with currently and, and your team and how can you process the information to, to impact on the things you mentioned, like programming, you know, like recovery. Um, and that is a, you know, it's, it's a long process. I, I started at Arsenal with looking at hamstrings in a similar way. And that's largely where this, this kind of concept really grew in terms of my perspective. Um, and I would say that when we started out with a monitoring process there, it was about 65% compliance and over a three year period, we built to about 95% compliance with this process. And that is daily education of players. That's some things, some mistakes being made along the way and learning from those mistakes. That's reaching out to people who are doing similar stuff in other, other organizations and learning from them too. So it's a, it's a, it's a bigger piece than just let's measure how much force you can push through a shoulder. I love that point that you made on the front end was just the, you know, the the actual compliance to the, even the assessment portion of it, because I think we overlook all this is that all the athletes we deal with, you know, particularly ones that have gone from high school to college, they've been private sector, they've been involved with organizations and in many cases have had repeated screens over the course of time. It's, 
it's an ask. You know what I mean? You know, it, most of these guys, when they when they do their intakes, they're you know they're fasted for blood work, and you know they're going through a, an entire movement screen. And and so when you start to layer performance tests and all these different things on it, before you realize you 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 basically stood there and judged them for for hours over the course of the day. So I, I think you know one of the things that that gets overlooked is like you have to you have to pick your asks. You have to figure out what are your highest priority, you know, things that you're going to assess and, you know, and certainly over the, the long haul, what are the things that you're going to monitor? Because ultimately it's, it's a distraction from whatever sport that they're going to play. So you have to be efficient with it. So in, in that regard, like where do you see shoulder specific monitoring um, for athletes? You know, where is it, where is it heading and where could it be better? Yeah. Um, I think it's it's a long way behind lower limb monitoring. So a lot of the lessons we've learned from ACL monitoring and some of the great work that's been done there with the research and and in particular the hamstring stuff um, is leading the way. And perhaps that's because there's been a focus and perhaps that's because um, there's more willingness to share uh, information. Whereas with shoulder monitoring, I think it's you know, lagging behind somewhat. Um, there's probably a few reasons behind that. Some some things around organizations not willing to share perhaps competitive information or things that they think give other teams a competitive advantage, but it's definitely catching up. And there's a lot of conversations around unpublished research with good teams doing good things. And, you know, I'm, I've become involved in a lot of those conversations now. So with the shoulder monitoring piece, firstly, it's not just about the shoulder, of course. I mean, you know, we're on a baseball podcast and it's really important to say that it's, it's how everything interacts to affect the shoulder. So a shoulder monitoring process, we classically look at tests of maybe handheld dynamometry of the upper limb. Um, but we also forget that we're doing some counter movement jump testing. And we're looking at maybe some, you know, lower limb lifts um, and lower body lifts. And we can actually use that and put those variables and those measures together to get a better picture of how people produce force from the ground up. So, I think where, where monitoring in shoulders is going is certainly towards that interaction of some key variables around how much force are you producing from the lower body? How are you transferring that force across the torso? And then, you know, what, what force when you need it can you produce through the shoulder? And that's, that's just the kind of kinetic piece, the force piece. But that is just part of the puzzle, a big puzzle, right? So you know, the athlete state at any one time in terms of their recovery from their last performance. There's also the piece around how they move. So the kinematics, and there's also that kind of tissue health piece, which sits there around past injury, you know, um, current state of their tissues with regard to, you know, tendon and muscle health and all of those things together, um, form this, overall piece that then gives you a, a good picture or a comprehensive picture of the athlete. So that's a, that's a big journey to go on. Yeah. So that's where it's going, but um, that's the start of it right now, I think. So you, you talked about this, the link between lower body and upper body uh, force production. Uh, maybe like, let's dig in a little bit deeper um, there. You know, what, what tendencies are you starting to see you know, with athletes where, and we've always heard the story about, you know, the guy with the, <laughs> the, the broken uh, toe, you know, winds up with a shoulder surgery a year later or something like that. I mean, that's obviously a very like grandiose image, but you know, on the smaller scale on a day-to-day -day basis, we certainly know that when the lower half isn't working, a lot of compensations can occur. So what are you guys looking at um, in particular in that trend? Yeah. Um, so there's some, there's some good work actually going on in, um, you know, in a, a few baseball teams. And one of the teams is working on looking at, um, ISO mid thigh pull. So isometric mid thigh pull is their, as their measure of lower limb force production. And when they compare that to a force platform test um, of the upper limb and they create a quadrant, what they see is they can group those athletes into different quadrants. So you've got the kind of high lower limb peak force, low upper limb peak force where there's a mismatch or the opposite way around where you've got like a high, upper limb peak force and a low, um, lower limb peak force. So the way of looking at those two quadrants in terms of that mismatch is that, you know, if you're developing a lot of force from the ground up, but you don't have enough in the shoulder, then 
basically you're overloading the shoulder. The shoulder isn't able to cope with it. And the other way around is where well, you're not producing, you're not accessing enough of your capacity, that kind of 51 to 54% of that force production that you need to throw. And if you're not doing it, you have to play catch up with the shoulder. And those people tend to be arm dominant. And what's really interesting about it is that, you know, when you start to map people on those quadrants, when you're looking at those players and you're an S&C coach or you're a physio, you can see that actually those match up a lot with what technical coaches are saying around throwing. So, you know, this guy is a bit more arm dominant. He is getting a lot of overload injuries. Perhaps we need to focus that programming then more on this lower, lower body force production um, component. I think the cool thing now is, um, you know, certainly, uh, you know, in stadium stuff, things like semi kinetrax, a lot of those, um, you know, biomechanical systems that are installed in stadiums, you can actually separate out where, you know, basically people rank in percentiles with respect to lower extremity and shoulder and elbow and wrist. And those same technologies are becoming more, you know, affordable and more available in the private sector as well, where you actually can have intervention strategies where, you know, if you bring the lower half around from a strength standpoint, does it change kind of where you fall in your ability to generate force from different portions of your body? I guess, you know, one thing I would ask for you, um, and this is less for the, the higher level athlete, maybe that's on this call, but more about, you know, the, the 15, 16, 17, 18 year old, like what, what in your mind is, is there a minimum threshold for strength? You know, is, you know, I always talk about, you know, you, you take a high school kid to a 315 for five trap bar deadlift and all of a sudden that loosey goosey, you know, teenager all of a sudden starts to feel athletic and move a little bit better, even without skill specific coaching. Do you think that there's a, there's a minimum threshold of strength that effectively buys an athlete a seat at the table in this discussion, like where, where nothing matters until you can do this. Yeah, I think that, I think there is this kind of this line in the sand that we can draw, you know, when we look at uh, a group of athletes, as an example, if we look at rugby players, or we look at um, baseball athletes, we can look at our cohort and say, well, yeah, this, this is the, this is the average of what we see. And above that line, we're going to say you're, you're strong. And below that line, we're going to say you're weak in terms of how you're, how you're producing force. So I think there is a line. Of course, there are outliers, you know, people who perhaps don't have or don't achieve those standards who can still throw well. But it, it's, it's like, what's the cost of that? You know, is, are they cheating? Are they compensating? And, and what's the sort of longevity of that over time? So I, I, Going back to your kind of question, I think there is, there is this standard and this minimum requirement for lower body strength as an example. And, you know, most of the studies on throwing things far or throwing things fast all point towards people needing to have that lower body force production as a basic requirement for sure. Nice. Um, and, and, you know, I guess the other one is, is what variables impact this? Like just in general, it seems like, you know, obviously there's a relative strength component, right? If you weigh 260, you know, you need to be a lot stronger relative to your body weight. I mean, or in the grand scheme of things, than someone who's 190 pounds, um, you know, I've always noticed taller athletes just need to be a little bit stronger than guys who are maybe a little bit shorter and don't have as much, you know, I, I guess leverages that they have to control. But I think another one for me that is intriguing, um, and I'd love to get your take on it is, you know, I often have this discussion with young pitchers about how you're, your back hip is much more about direction than it is about distance. So in the example, if you have a, a right-handed individual and basically kind of collapse into that knee and, and, and drift towards third base, an athlete like that obviously has to reorient themselves dramatically in order to you know, throw a glove side fastball or do anything just to throw a strike. Um, you know, do, we, do we know whether the direction from the back hip um, you know, impacts how strong somebody needs to be. Presumably that front foot has to brace even harder if you have a really long way to go, you know, versus, you know, someone who has a very clean, you know, path to the plate. Yeah, I think what, what you're sort of, um, what you're alluding to there is this, uh, is this idea of looking at, you know, kinematics and, and then almost separating that out a little bit from the, from the forced side. So, yeah, what I, what I was talking about before was measuring, you know, measuring and testing force. And when we start to get into things like looking at, you know, uh, a lateral hop for distance or a single leg, uh, a single leg squat or a single leg counter movement jump and things like that, we're we're looking at some of the capabilities of an athlete around that, maybe that 
difference between front and back leg. Um, but we're not commenting from that always on how they're moving and how they're achieving that. So their strategy is, is also a key component of, of how they're performing in tests. And so where I'm going with that is, yeah, I think there is a kinematic piece. So is there, are they throwing with appropriate technique to utilize their capacity to throw and, and use their force? Um, can we pick that up when we test them and when we watch them jump and land? So if they're going to do a counter movement jump and they're landing and they look like a melting candle, you know, with their knees drifting inwards and they're pronating and they're, you know, losing everything, then that's probably going to carry over in some way and transfer over into how they're throwing and how they're moving. So I think that's, you know, an interesting thing. We, we don't really have the answers on that yet, but I think the more we, the more we try and make that connection between those two things, um, the more we're going to understand how tests that are things like counter movement jump transfer into the, the throwing performance itself. I like it. Um, so, you know, we're, we're going to kind of stay maybe in the shoulder main house, I guess, get a little bit more specific underneath this, this monitoring umbrella. Um, you know, you, you've talked a, a lot about, um, uh, you know, isometrics for shoulder health and we use, you know, tons of them. And I'm, I'm just curious, like how you integrate them, um, not just in baseball players, but I, I know for you also like working in rugby, the last thing you want to do is exhaust a player before he goes out and, you know, participates in a match that you know, has an even stronger, you know, metabolic conditioning standpoint than we, you know, encounter in the baseball world. So talk to me about the importance of isometrics when you use them and, and, and also, you know, kind of what the, the volume you might integrate them with in, in some of these populations that have to be careful about exhausting themselves before competition. Yeah. So, I mean, my background is as a physiotherapist, so I've done a lot, a lot of years of using therabands and you know light weights and and um, perhaps more sort of you know we describe it as maybe more functional exercises. But because I progressed on and have done some stuff around strength and conditioning, I think the loading part is key. You know, actually high threshold stability is a key component of shoulder health. So. My, my feeling is we're not loading shoulders heavy enough. Um, that's one thing to say. The other thing to say is that, you know, strength tends to suffer throughout a competitive season. So, you know, you get a preseason to build it up and then it tends to deteriorate throughout. So we're looking for opportunity to microdose in something that's going to maintain strength throughout a season. So as an example in rugby, um, in a warm up, in a 15 minute warm up prior to going out to a session, holding a dumbbell that's around 16 to 18% of body weight in the hand for six times five second holds. You know, actually, the SNC coach passing the dumbbell into the hand in a short lever position. So, a 90 90, um, sorry, a 90 0 uh, shoulder abduction. It's a, it's a visual one, this one, but 90 degrees abduction, elbow flex to 90 and the, the rotation is neutral. So holding that dumbbell there in a short lever at very high load. Um, and that is based on having a really nice healthy shoulder and an intact, an intact cuff and all those other pieces that need to be there. But let's not be afraid to load. And that's a six times five second dose. So you're only talking about 30 seconds of work. But if you do that regularly throughout a week at the right time in the right place, the idea is that it's not gonna have a cost things like eccentric muscle actions are going to give a cost. And so I think the timing of that using isometrics can maintain strength and force production throughout a season. And that's, that's the aim. I think the other thing in the baseball world, that's a, a crucial part of that discussion is so think about it this way. We've all seen like those freeze frames of baseball players where, you know, a pitcher has maximal external rotation. They're laid back and their, their form is, is effectively parallel to the ground. So there's tons and tons of valgus stress and, anterior shoulder forces in that position, that's a really hard position to train. Um, you know, you give somebody yeah. a cable, you give somebody a dumbbell, and, you know, we're not anywhere near that. When you actually talk about isometric stuff, particularly it's, you know, manual resistance with, you know, like a qualified coach or something like that, you can start to approximate that range a little bit more. So I don't think it's just that you're getting forces that are appropriate. It's also that you're getting some very specific joint angles that they probably give you what, you know, 10 to 15 degrees of carryover in either direction. Um, I think that gets overlooked a lot. And it's, it's honestly one of the things that I see as a shortcoming of a lot of 
rehabilitation programs is we never actually approximate the injury mechanism in the exercise we choose as we bring somebody back. So the first time they, they go and throw a baseball at a high level, it's, it's the first time they've been exposed to it. Yeah, and I think you, you sort of pick up a nice thing there in that, you know, this, sometimes we're going to measure that isometric. So whether that's using a percentage of your body weight in the gym as a sort of low tech option, other times you can use a handheld dynamometer or, or some sort of fixed dynamometer, depending on what, you, what you've got available to you to actually make a, make a, a, a judgment about, you know, are they, are they weak in terms of internal rotation force production? And if they are, then we need to focus on that and program accordingly because a lot of people focus on the external rotation component, which, you know, is, is fair based on the shoulder architecture and what we tend to see. But when there's that internal rotation uh, deficit, you know, and it's left there untrained and, uh, you know, unfixed, if you like, I think that's got a huge, uh, a huge capacity to improve shoulders, particularly in terms of that protection of external rotation, you know, and, um, and, and protecting that anterior shear as well. So a lot of the things that you've been talking about are great. They're very focused on osteoconics, right? So, you know, powerful, you know, lats and pecs and, you know, force production in that capacity. But we both know, you know, from a, a long-term movement health standpoint that the arthrokinematic control, the, the rolling, the rocking, the gliding in the joint is equally important for, for keeping keep, uh, people, you know, healthy. So how do you, how do you kind of balance those two things, right? You, you obviously want people to exert brute strength at the right time, but at the same time, we want the, the finer control to offset it. So, you know, are there, are there tests that you look at differently in that vein or, or how do you attack it? Yeah, I think, you know, for, for me, that sort of um, good, healthy performing shoulder has a really nice underlying arthrokinematic control. So, you know, it's not possible to consistently throw hard or produce high forces with powerful muscles without that underlying control, um, without, without getting injured. And so, you know, when we look at it, actually, there's certain positions you can put the joint in that you're able to disadvantage the more powerful muscle groups. Um, for an example, putting, uh, putting the joint in 90 degrees abduction and testing internal rotation biases more towards subscap or the anterior shoulder and those small stabilizers, those, well, not so small, but stabilizing muscle groups um, versus testing or putting the arm by the side where you're going to get much more pec and lat involvement. And the second part is really, well, when you're, when you're testing, we've already described that you're looking at strategy. So are they able to maintain a nice, you know, athletic start position without very global patterns of movement? So when you watch them produce force, if you're asking them to internally rotate, are they adducting, dragging down, depressing the whole shoulder yeah. girdle, loading and anteriorly dumping through the shoulder? And these are the actions of those sort of more global, more powerful muscles. And that means they're winning the battle against those local stabilizers. So it's not just about force and output and score it's it's completely about strategy and almost like beautiful movement and beautiful beautiful performance of that test that gives you a better idea of whether an athlete is actually able to use those local stabilizing muscle groups i, I love that observation there's a there's a qualitative component to quantitative assessments and, and people so rarely look at whether a, you know an athlete's diving into an aggressive scapular anterior tilt when they do ir or they're they're really tugging down and you know, and toning up the lat when they should be relaxing to test external rotation. I think those are, those are vitally important for like the young clinicians and sports scientists that are on this, um, this, this you know, podcast listening, because it is, it is something that it, it, it effectively cooks your data. You know, you're not really getting an accurate measure of what you're trying to actually assess. Yeah. hundred percent, hundred percent. You know, same, same score, different strategy is not the same test result. That's a great, great line. I'm going to steal that. Um, so here's, here's a fun one um, that I, I, I didn't have on my list of notes, but I'm going to, I'm going to pivot because it gets me excited. So, um, you know, one of the things that, that we've seen now is, you know, as an example, um, you know, a lot of people over the years have kind of like, you know, steadfastly denied the role of manual therapy and, you know, and managing, you know, some, you know, conditions at any joint. And, and now we're getting just much better technology that allows us to assess what happens with, you know, dry needling or cupping or any of these interventions. And, and we can actually start to see some of these things that we kind of suspected were happening when new athletes felt better afterwards. 
but only now are we really able to start to quantify them. So, you know, Sue Falcone did a great presentation just recently where she demonstrated you know, kind of fascial layers glide, gliding after a coupling intervention. And um, so I'm curious, what gets you excited? What, what is out there on the monitoring front that's new that you think is going to, you know, change the game, so to speak, with how we, we manage athletes, whether it's the shoulders or, or really any other, other joints that you, you spend a lot of time focusing on? Yeah, um, I think I think there's some really nice work at the moment going on uh, in in basketball, as an example, and uh, it, it's a it's a concept that's been used by a guy called Jared Anflick, and what he's looking at is kind of um, ultrasound tissue characterization, so looking at patella and Achilles tendons, and looking at a picture of the tendon to to determine its kind of health status, if you like. Mm-hmm. And that, not just that in isolation, because of course that, that's you know, not, not meaningless, but the context is the key to how you interact with that. And then combining that with tests of jumping and combining that with tests of kinematics, so how people are moving while they're jumping, that gives you a very kind of holistic profile of, of that athlete in time. And I think that that's a really nice way of thinking, not necessarily... Um, new technology, you know, UTC has been around for a long time. Um, so have force platforms and so have kind of kinematic and motion capture. But the, the, the sort of high performance thinking around that process is probably the thing that, um, you know, excites me and, and more about what I know teams use that for in terms of changing the way they work. And so I think that's the, that's the, the way to go. And it's certainly around my own research is the way that I'm going with that with, with regard to shoulders um, yeah, that's, that's, I'm, I'm not trying to, you know, find the next silver bullet. I think we've got a lot of good stuff already and we just need to dig in a little bit deeper in terms of how we think and how we apply that. Where do you, where do you think the, the, the next generation of research needs to go? What, what keeps you up staring into blackness at, at 3 a.m. wondering what we can do? <laughs> I think I'd love to apply, um, I'd love to apply a lot of the sort of, um, the lower body testing on looking at some muscle architecture, you know, around shoulders. I think that's, um, uh, that's pretty exciting work around, you know, particularly rotator cuff. Um, and then, as I say, like the, the interaction between the tests we've been talking about and how that then fits in with, you know, throwing a baseball fast. So can you start to, can you start to see a, a correlation, uh, you know, between, a combination of factors um, that will lead you to say that this guy has more likelihood of throwing a baseball fast and also in the same breath, does it also potentially protect them from injury in either shoulder or elbow going forward? You know, those are, those are the key bits. So not just the testing, but the, the application and how that fits with performance for athletes. I love that. Um, So talk to me about where else you, you kind of are applying some of your, your, your excitement about monitoring like i know obviously this isn't just a a shoulder specific world especially because you're working in rugby and you're working in you know elite soccer slash football um where else do you do you see um you know a huge need for this where if you could take some of the stuff that you're doing on the monitoring side in europe and carry over to some of these american sports uh what, what are some 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 places where you think it fits perfectly yeah i mean so the the system of the system of monitoring from looking at like football, soccer is, um, you know, we play maybe play maybe three games a week um, in a in a dense period of fixtures, and one of the biggest injuries that we face is is the hamstring injury, you know, and that's something that's been there in football for a long period of time and and doesn't seem to be changing massively. So, understanding where someone is in their recovery profile after a game is the real key component of how we can build that pitch to decide what we're going to do next to make sure that they're ready for that next game and their their hamstring injury risk is is as as low as we can get it so what we do is we set up a process that looks at them two days after you know a high intensity exposure so we're talking hamstrings we're talking sprinting maximally you know and that dose of sprinting that they go through in the game and naturally that muscle's recovering for the next 72 hours so what's happening to that muscle on day two? And so we use, in, at Arsenal and in my current role, we, 
we use isometric hamstring testing. And we've got data on our athletes to know where they should be back by 48 hours after, after a game. And if they're higher than normal and they're back recovered, that's great news. But if they're lower than normal and they're not fully recovered, we'll retest them the next day. And then we can start to make programming decisions around exposing them again to the high intensity actions. And I think how that can transfer nicely is, okay, it can directly transfer into preventing hamstring injuries in anybody that sprints, but it can also be a process and a thought process that you can use to say, well, you know, if we've got a starting pitcher and we know what their recovery of their arm force production or their shoulder force production is by day two, we're also going to look at a counter movement jump to say, well, is there whole body fatigued or is it just an isolated upper limb or lower body problem? And then, then we can start to make some inferences and change maybe what they're going to do on that day. Maybe it's, you know, skinning down some of the bullpen work they're going to do to prepare them ultimately for their next game. And that's really what we're, what we're about is understanding what we can do to change that recovery so that they're ready and fresh and ready to you know, perform at their optimum for the next game. Yeah, and, and you know, it kind of underlies the importance of the the athlete coach relationship too, because you know, I think maybe where baseball is, is unique to to what you're maybe dealing with in other realms is you know the the routine is so heavily guarded. You know, what I mean, if you're I'm yeah. a day I'm a day two or a day three bullpen, you know, till I die. That's how they they kind of view this. So the idea of you know pushing a bullpen back a day or not throwing the same thirty six pitches in that bullpen that they've thrown their entire career, or even you know throwing a you know, a flat gunner just playing catch instead of throwing a bullpen. There, there are very few guys in baseball that are willing to deviate from that. So I think it, yep. it speaks to kind of, you know, establish the relationship, but also figure out where else you might be able to, to redistribute the stress. If you can't, if you can't change the, the actual skill specific aspect of it, can you pull back on how much they sprint or how much they do in the weight room or something like that? Just creative ways to keep tabs on guys and to, to fluctuate loading throughout a cycle. And one of the things that I've done with athletes, you know, proactively is, is we've effectively built in deloads in their strength training programs. Historically speaking, like in season training was always about just maintain, maintain, maintain. And, and I would just emphasize to guys that, Hey, every fourth week, we're going to pull back. Even if you don't feel like we need to pull back because we're trying to head some of this stuff off over the course of the year. Yeah. And I hear that. And it's, it's interesting, isn't it? Because, you know, certainly with hamstrings, there's still lots of hamstring injuries and, and it, as as you allude to really nicely, there's this piece around education and changing the way that we go about our business. You know, and if it's the right way, or if it if it's going to improve that particular individual in terms of their recovery, it's going to reduce their likelihood of you know picking up some shoulder time loss or some shoulder soreness that's going to affect their performance. Then I think it's it's the right thing to do. It's just about our ability to influence that. And sometimes, unfortunately. You know, you've got the numbers in front of you. You, you. you talk to people about maybe skinnying back or changing their routine. They don't do it and then they break down. And then that's the piece that unfortunately leads to a change. Mm-hmm. Um, and your ability to influence then is, is obviously greater. You know, what can we do to change this? What can we do to stop getting this athlete injured, to stop them getting hamstring injuries or to stop them picking up shoulder soreness? Um, and that's your window. So you need to be ready. And uh, I think it makes a lot of sense, but I do hear you. Like I spoke at the beginning, the cultural aspects yeah. are, are massive um, in terms of you know, making sure you get that buy-in. Yeah, for sure. I love it. Um, this was absolutely outstanding. So folks can find out more about you. You're, um, you're at Athletic Shoulder on Instagram. And it's at Ben Ashworth on Twitter. And then um, your website is athleticshoulder.com. Lots of good stuff. I know you, you've also got a podcast that you run on your own as well, correct? Yeah. So the, uh, yeah, the informed performance podcast, which we're going to release, uh, release this on. And hopefully uh, I'm going to take you up on the opportunity to sort of have a part two with you back on there if, if possible, mate. Love it. That, that sounds like a blast. Nice. Well, well, thank you very much for taking the time, Ben. This was, uh, this is super informative. I think it, you know, beyond just the actual, you know, X's and O's of, you know, here are the things we're monitoring, here are the interventions. I think it was good for, for giving a lot of, um, you know, coaches, clinicians out there, 
things to think about as they work their way through this. What are the potential challenges? Where are the places where this could could absolutely change your programs and your interactions with athletes? I think it's um it's cool to to give them food for thought and, and you know and ultimately hopefully we got a, a young sports scientist that's going to pay it forward and take the uh, the industry to the next level in the next you know couple decades. So so thank you for taking the time. No, I really appreciate uh, you know the invitation to come on, the opportunity to chat and and. You know, people should feel free to reach out to me. I love a conversation around shoulders and, um, you know, anything we can do to do some good work with good people. Outstanding. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining us for another episode of the CSP Elite Baseball Development Podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, we'd be thrilled if you'd consider subscribing to the podcast and leaving us a review to read on iTunes. We welcome your suggestions for future guests and questions. Just email Elite Baseball Podcast at gmail.com. Thank you for your continued support, and we'll see you next episode.